would have expected that at all. You can explain it later. So first of all, thank you so much, guys. This has been a long week. We started out on Sunday, Monday, what was it, four years ago? And, um, <laughs> and you've navigated the Mediterranean or wherever it was, and you've learned all these weird things about Moscow and four ways to make decisions and five ways. And four. It's awful, isn't it? Awful, awful. But you can say, I do declare. I do declare. And so the transition from I do declare into I can actually do this is, is a, I think, obviously what we're trying to do here as well. But if I can say this, thank you so much for your enthusiasm and your, uh, your engagement as we've done all the exercises. This was out of my comfort zone, but not in a discomfort zone. Can I explain that? So I was definitely, we had a talk on, on this. So I definitely 100 people. It's the biggest I've ever done. I mean, I've done bigger talks, but never with people doing activities. And I was concerned you wouldn't actually do them. You know, you just go out and have a cigarette or in the old days. Uh, <laughs> but everybody did it. Remember that. Everybody did it. It's been phenomenal. So thank you so much for that. Um, but we do. No, it's been great. Um, but we do want your feedback, of course. We want your feedback because if we do run this again, we want to see how we can make it better. But I think it's been really good. Um, I've been locked in a room without windows for five days. It's really hard, isn't it? It's really. And then you go to another room without windows. Um, <laughs> and you know that out there there's the sun, this amazing thing called the sun. Um, so let's just do this. It's a recap and a, and a wrap up. But I wanted to try something with you. Um, this is kind of a sad moment for me, not just for the end of the class, but also the PMBOK is finishing this year, as I mentioned to you, the PMBOK 5. Um, so every five years, we recycle the PMBOK. It's like the Yankees, when they change their shirts just to make money, isn't it? Because all the kids have to buy their new shirts. So PMBOK does this. So PMBOK 6 is coming out. As you know, we have uh, the draft version is out. It's 50, not 47. So it's all done. So I wanted to say goodbye to the PMBOK. And you were hearing the hallelujah. That was not a, an accident. Now, I'm not going to sing it, so don't worry. I'm not going to sing it. But... I want you to see it. It's the hallelujah. So I heard that there's a secret source where workers go to chart a course, but you don't really care for projects, do you? <laughs> it looks like this, the fourth, now fifth. It's got so heavy, it's hard to lift. The baffled pimps proclaiming hallelujah. OK, and you sing hallelujah. Of course, you get the idea if we were doing this right. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You heard them arguing on the roof. And all they really needed was a framework. That's all they needed. That's all they needed. You gather them around the conference wall. You laid out the steps, 47 in all. You won't forget that, will you? And in their eyes, you saw the hallelujah. And you sing hallelujah, of course. You got this idea. OK, so we won't do that one. Right? Boy, they said, we've been here before. We know this room. We've walked this floor. But we were so confused before we saw this. Each step, it has its place in the pack. And now it seems like we're back on track. And from their mouths, you heard the hallelujah. This is, well, we'll see if it works. <laughs> you did your best. It wasn't much. You saw the light. They felt the touch. <laughs> you told the truth. You didn't try to fool them. OK, it's a big song, isn't it? It's a big song. <laughs> OK. And even if this was an amazing picture, 100 PMPs holding up a book and smiling, that is, <laughs> that is weird. And even if it all goes wrong, we'll still have this pinbox song, won't we? <laughs> At least until version 6 cries hallelujah. So thank you very much for this, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. OK. So this has been a great week for me because I get to try out different things. And there's one thing that, as you know from my accent, um, being from Ireland, we we come from a story tradition. Ireland is very much. We didn't actually write down a language until 1850. And that's why we couldn't afford all the alphabet stuff that you guys have. But um, there's four Irish guys in the room. And they have much better accents. And if it's OK with you, Kieran has the best accent for Irish. If you're going to pick accents, he's got the one. If you want to buy an accent, he's got it. It's a really good accent. So what I did was I wrote an article for um, The New Yorker. It's called Shouts and Murmurs. I don't know if you know it. it, it um, I haven't sent it in yet, but I wanted to try it out. If that's OK with you, it's only going to take uh, four minutes. But I'm going to ask Kieran. And here's the, here's the idea. They, <laughs> Kieran, do you want to start coming up here? They find, here's the synopsis. They find a manuscript uh, off the west coast of Ireland saying that Odyssey was actually not about Odysseus, but about a man called Odysseus, Paddy Odysseus, <laughs> as in. <laughs> Paddy Obama, as you know, right? And it wasn't Ithaca, it was Inishmore, which is the island here on the left. Now, this is really brave of Kieran, because he does not want what he's going to read. This is really interesting. So with the best, um, would you be, just give him a round of applause and to say thank you very much. Um, 
I'll just explain to you. So this is an oral tradition. The Odyssey was not written down until 300 BC. So in Homer's time, everybody would just speak. And this is what he's going to do. He's going to try and read out this. Uh, just see if it'll work. Okay. Uh, some of the words, uh, Maxime gave me permission to use a word here. It sounds like a curse word. It's not. It's actually <laughs> Irish. He speaks Gaelic. And this is one of the things you do speak Gaelic. Yeah. So there's a little bit of Gaelic in here as well. Okay. So good luck. Come on, boys. A good start is half the battle. You can explain it from the top. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I have to set the scene as well. Scene, a crowd of 600 men are seen pushing 12 boats into the sea off Troy. Come on, boys. A good start is half the battle, shouted Odysseus. The man of twists and turns to his weary men. Ten long years have passed, and the mistress and young snapper will be missing me. He was still very pissed that they did. <laughs> That's the word, I think. <laughs> that they had given the wooden horse to the, to the Trojans as he had really built it as a surprise for his kid. You lads need to be thinking of your loved ones too, you know. And so began the journey that we now call the Odyssey. Ha, <laughs> big twisty fella. Can we stop here for some quick pillaging? Said a few of the troubled men, only a few miles out from Troy. We promise, no messing, just a quick one. In and out, come on. <laughs> And so the journey home was waylaid at the very first opportunity. Well, the pillaging led to drinking, the local strong wine, which led to the messing around and sleeping on the beach. At dawn, the local Ciconians, could be Corkonians, <laughs> returned from the hills and set them running from the beach with their tails between their legs. Not a great start to the trip, thought a proud Odysseus, determined to avoid any more distractions. Scene. There's a few of these scenes, by the way. Bad weather forced them off course, and they, they land on a strange land covered with thistles in bloom. Lads, what have you been eating? said Odysseus after a few days. You've both sides of the road to yourselves, and you're without mind or memory. For this is how Odysseus spoke, and also how he learned about the powerful narcotic effect of the lotus flowers. <laughs> Jesus, I might go to fucking call me. The men showed no interest in continuing the journey or even leaving the field of flowers. Frustrated, he was forced to clobber them and set sail again. <laughs> Scholars note, the description of the lotus flower is very similar to a nondescript, tasteless, flowering thistle called a shellig sh shaita. <laughs> that might be the other one. Found in the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland. <laughs> Linguists speculate that this unique flowering plant gave rise to the well-known Irish expressions, you look like shite. God, <laughs> 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 oh, man, kill and, Oh, man, this tastes like shite. <laughs> I did not write this. <laughs> Scene. They landed on the island of Sicily, and a few of them stumbled into a cave. This is a real big fella's pad, said one of the men looking at the mess of the large cave. His parents didn't raise him too well. The absent big fella turned out to be one particularly nasty Cyclops, son of Poseidon, nephew of Zeus, and hungry for two of the men. So much for your customary genia, said Odysseus. You are supposed to welcome us and give us hugs and presents, not eat us like wild potatoes. This monster was too big to fight, so Odysseus resorted to his legendary trickery. He poked the monster in his only eye and escaped under some huge sheep. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you, he did. <laughs> you can't catch me, shouted Odysseus childishly from his boat as they rowed away hastily. It is I, Odysseus, son of Laerty, king of a small rocky island who hath fooled you, he added rather pompously. The Cyclops immediately called out to his dad, and so Odysseus learned the hard way not to mess with the gods or any of their children. I think this is the final scene. Yeah. Scene. The winds blew the lonely boat off course again, this time to Aea, the island of Circe, a witch who turned the remaining men into pigs. <laughs> True story. You look like shite, <laughs> said Odysseus. <laughs> what in heaven's name did she do to you? But they couldn't answer, as they really were like pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I have a plan, says Odysseus, <laughs> to no one in particular which made him smile. I will offer my body to her for their release. It must have worked because a year later they were all living, like to get, all living together like a big happy family. We think we should be going home, boss, said a group of the men to Odysseus. There is such a thing as too much of a good thing, and he agreed. Just turn over one more, just a few more lines, that's it, and in the end. That's oh, the Jesus. End. <laughs> just, just this picture. I will miss your twists and turns, says Saoirse, coyly from the bed, coyly from the bed even. 
But first, you must stop by the underworld and ask the guide, Teresius, for directions home. Odysseus hated asking for directions, but she was insistent, and so they went to hell and back to get clear directions from the Bile Green Sea to Ithaca. A good start is half the battle, said Odysseus cheerily as she, they rode away from Circe. And the men all groaned in unison at his use of the ancient phrase for the hundredth time. <laughs> they they were all so wise because the story wasn't even half over. Jesus, God loves us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kieran. He might explain. So in Irish, we have expression, too small Latin Hebrew. A good start is half the battle. And our parents tell us that over and over again, isn't it? A good start is half the battle. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Um, let's get back to some of the serious stuff. Cross-cutting skills. We won't have time to do this, but in your spiral bound books, can you see it? Just open them. The last exercise you'll see, there's two things, cross-cutting skills here and cross-cutting skills here. So what you want to do now is, we're not going to do it in the class, so just make sure you can find it. When you're back at home, what I want you to do is write in something about one of these cross-cutting skills. Just write in. This is kind of a glossary. It's kind of a vocabulary test. But just remember, we can't test your skill in the exam, but we test your knowledge of the skill. So you have to look at these. There's quite a few of them when you see it here. So again, take this home with you uh, and do it. So here's what I'll ask you to do. So take it home, fill it out. Use the pin box, use the glossary, but also rely on your, your groups here. Talk to your groups, talk to the pod. And only in emergency, ask your section leaders because they're heavily overworked. And, and so, actually, could you do this? A big round of applause for the section leaders. They've been really good for me this week. Um, uh, so thank you. I, I didn't know you knew you were signing up for all of this when you came here. So the song is in the book. You see, some people are. That's good. So the song is in the book. The poem is in the book. Do you remember from the cards that we did, the nine cards? Do you remember way back on Tuesday when you were much younger? And my hair wasn't so great. So we did these cards. Do you remember? We had the sword and the shield. And we had the lighthouse. Ralph saw the lighthouse as something different, but it's good. You had this idea of connecting somehow with the pinbok. And so yeah, the poem is there. Actually, both poems. So just quickly about the exam. Um, it's a computer-based exam. OK, it's four hours, 200 questions, about a minute per question. It's expensive. It's $500. Um, you have to work out this. It's better to join as a member and get, you know, get the membership benefits and then pay than it is to do it without being a member. So I would suggest you do this. 25 of the questions do not count. I find this wrong, actually. You're going to be used as guinea pigs for the next generation. So we'll put in 25 questions that you will never know whether they're the right questions or not. So you have to assume you get those right. So when you're thinking of the percentages, you have to get 62% of 175. You have to get the other 25 right. Or you understand? You won't know which ones they are. Um, you need 4,500 hours experience, 7,500 if you don't have a degree. But this is one of the hardest things to do, so please start doing that now. I think on the way home, just go back eight years and write down the experience that you've had on project management and do this. You need 35 formal hours. One of the things we need to make sure is you all sign. Now, apparently, some of you haven't signed. Um, Andrea's got the sheet back there. If you haven't signed in, make sure you do before you leave. I need proof that you've been here, and then you get the certificate. So that's uh, a deal that we do. You all done? I think, um, OK, if everybody's done it, that's great. Um, Heather just said to check this. OK, so the exam question, I can't even read some of these slides. Uh, you will never know how you scored, OK? Uh, you'll never know. So you're, there's no such thing as an 80% or a 90% or 95%. You're just either proficient or not proficient going forward. Uh, just very quickly, I'm going to run through these, because I'm sure this is so easy for you, isn't it? Um, do you remember? Integration management, do you remember that idea of the outputs from this? Do you remember doing all of those things? Um, that's nasty, because I said I wouldn't ask you questions, but I will. W will you talk to each other and say, what's the output from each one of these? Just what's the output? Just see if you can do that from each one of these. What's the point? The pin box is there. It says there's a process, there's an output, which will become an input, OK? And then we could do the same for scope management, couldn't we? We would say scope is really important. And perhaps the difference between collect the requirements and define the scope. One is where we gather them from the stakeholders. The other is where we use Moscow and, and say what's in, what's out of. And remember, validate the scope is accepted deliverables. So this idea of deliverables focused, you got this. I mean, we've done a huge journey. You, this is all amazing. You could open the book. You would know where to look. You understand. You've, you've, you've got this vocabulary now. I mean, I, I wish I was the way that I could bring you back to where you were on Monday. It's impossible, but it would be interesting to go back there and say, do you remember what it was like? Um, and so 
Do you remember the estimating the activities and the duration? Remember the estimating those two types of perch? Remember analogous and parametric? You learned a lot of things, and um, three-point estimating, as we mentioned. What was the other type of three-point estimating? Perch was one. The other one was called triangular. OK, so you got that idea of triangular here. And then the costs and the formulas, and okay, we'll come back into that in a second, but the earned value formulas. But the budget being different from the funding, make sure you understand that concept of the budget being different from the funding. And quality, all the dead people. Do you remember Maslow? That's not quality. Come on, you can't fool you people, can I? I mean, they're all the dead people on the other side, aren't they? There's a cemetery on this for the quality guys. Just talk about four quality guys at the table. Just at least name probably five or six. Just talk about four or five and say Deming, Duran, Fagenbaum, Taguchi, Ishikawa. OK. Let's come back together again. So likewise, in human resource, probably the biggest growth area in project management and certainly the biggest growth area in reading material. I hope when you go home from this, there's a lot more appetite for reading books about human resource management, conflict, motivation, just understanding the brain. Um, and again, we met some dead people here. We met Maslow and Hertzberg and McGregor. Does anybody remember McGregor, X and Y? You got it. Some people remember this. And then we had Vroom, who said there was three things, expectancy theory. Just discuss together and say, what's he talking about? It's three things. They have to be clear. Expectancy theory. Victor Vroom, just talk to each other and say, I got this. OK, and you know where to go. But on a project in WSP, you could now say, can we check these three things? Is it clear what we're trying to do? Does this team have the capacity to do this thing that we've just said? And then what's in it for them? What's in it for them? OK, communications. We talked about DIKW. You see this theme running through. It's almost like a river running through it, isn't it? So you see this theme. Data becomes information, becomes knowledge, becomes wisdom. And we talked about stakeholders and engagement and those kind of things as well, didn't we? So these are all connected. Stakeholders and communications were actually the same knowledge area when we did the PMBOK. So stakeholders had five stages of engagement. There's five of you at the table. Just say, what are the stages of engagement of the stakeholders? Just go around the table and say, these are easy questions. OK. These are insulting for you now, isn't it? These questions are insulting before you get on the plane. You think, who would not know that? Who would not have that vocabulary? Risk management. Remember so much in risk management, the idea of identifying and analyzing and responding. Do you remember the response options? Write them down. For the, do it as a team. I, three positive, three negative. They're actually the opposite of each other. My response options in risk. What are my response options? Yeah. So, so there's such a volume of material in your head right now. If some of you could just go take the exam now, it would be perfect, isn't it? Remember, you're going to lose about 5% every week. So just, we'll think about this, about 5% every week. Procurement management. Remember the contracts and the main types of contracts and the agreements and source selection criteria and all that kind of stuff. And stakeholders, of course, we've already mentioned them. But those people interested, impacted, and we put them into quadrants. And this is why I gave you the scorecard. This is easy to remember when you remember. Keep satisfied. You guys got it. I just started off, and you guys. I know this song. This is my favorite song. Hallelujah. You love these? On the right-hand side, everybody just look at the formulas on the right-hand side and say, I know exactly what these formulas are. You cannot fool me. Just talk to your colleagues if you don't know. Say, what is that one on the left? What is that one on the right?
OK? So remember these formulas. And again, this should be easy for you as engineers and planners. This is quite straightforward questions. These will be your, your go-to questions in the exam. This is a bit harder, isn't it? You have to learn this. This is not something you can do in a class. You'll practice these things. The only thing I want you to see really on this is down here. So the TCPI is relatively new to PMBOK, this idea of two complete performance index. So it's great that you have your earned value, but now what Jeff was trying to explain is, what about going forward? How do I look forward? And so the TCPI tells me, what do I need to do to go forward? Now, in that case, greater than one is bad. That means we've got to add resources, we've got to add people in. Or less than one is good, we can let some people go to other projects, okay? So just be careful of that one in the exam. They don't want you to do calculations. They just want you to understand. Do you understand? That's not what we're trying to do here. OK. We can practice this one. Here's an example. Just let me check to see. Just tell me, is this project good or bad? Do not do any calculations. As a team, just say, is this project good or bad? Tell me how bad it is. Can we say it's bad, bad? Can we say it's bad, bad? So it's bad on time, bad on cost. You think, seriously, you're kidding me. Now, you can do the calculations if you want, but you don't need to because you know this. Now do this one and just say, do I see it? OK, do I see it? You see it. So in the exam, you've only got one minute per question. So you have to see things. That's what I remember the FedEx arrow. Some of you, many saw the FedEx arrow for the first time. Just remember back on Monday, you think, I see. I see this now. Yeah. You will feel this urge when you go back. You're saying, can I show you something? This is quite cool. Also, how many letters in the Irish alphabet, which is not important. So. Remember, PERT was taken out of the PMBOK. We now have two types of three-point estimating. We have this uh, beta version, and then we have the triangular version. So just be aware of that as we go forward. The calculations, we saw that yesterday. Please, remember that exercise we did on communications channels? That was really to try and explain that. When your project gets above five, six, seven people. So you might have heard of agile project management. The whole point of agile is to try and get back to small groups just for that kind of stuff, get back to co-location. It makes eminent sense. It's impossible in your environment because the projects are so big. So just be careful about this. Setting up a study plan. I would strongly recommend that you tell each person at the table now when you're going to take the exam. This is the single biggest motivator to get you to do it, is your friends will say, you're a fraud. You told me. So do this now. <laughs> tell your friends when you're going to do the exam. Tell them. Just turn to the So thanks for doing this. Motivation is, yeah, sorry, Colleen's got a question. Sorry, guys. One, sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. You can only get after you get your PMP. You, 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 they don't start. This is all before PMP, so this goes for the application. You might already have them already. Um, my understanding is if you do the modules, you get PDUs for that as well. I needed to check this, but you also get PDUs for being here. You should have more than enough PDUs to start applying right now. Yeah. <laughs> I heard you had finished the online. Are you, are you suggesting there's some people in the room? Are there some people in the room who haven't? That would be difficult. That would be like starting behind everybody when you're running a marathon, isn't it? You've already handicapped yourself. So, so <laughs> here's the thing. I think if you go and do the online now, it'll be much richer. You, it, no, but it will be because you'll think, wow, I'm learning so much because now I see what I didn't see. Whereas to do it the other way around is hard, isn't it? You don't know, what, you don't know what's coming at you. So now I think, A, it will be quicker. No, I would finish, please finish out all those things. Um, I'm not sure how the online works, but because I, I don't do online, I only do the, I'm the old fashioned guy stands up in front of you, yeah. It's, um, It, once you get past the 35, there's no more. Then once you get your PMP, you need to get another 60. You got to get another. You, the clock starts again. Um, uh, we'll extend it for as long as you need. Just uh, contact uh, Colleen or Andrea. Um, uh, Andrea, sorry, and we'll get the. So, but don't worry. We'll uh, through Heather. We'll be able to make sure you get it. But um, 
we'll make sure there's no problem with that. I don't want any excuses for not having finished the online. Okay, there'll be no excuses. Um, the 80 questions, has everybody got a copy of the 80 questions? This is not representative of the exam. This is just to get you started. The exam will be much harder. You saw Perry talking about this. What I'm trying to do here is just get you thinking of this one minute per question, one minute. So do your own earned value. After 30 minutes, I've done 30. After 50, I've done 50. And then practice. But you can do it online as well, of course. But this is good. Just set yourself some time. Just make, it, make time for yourself and do it. No, I'm not giving you the answers. No, that would be. Um, with Heather, I'm going to make them available to you. So I will send you them probably um, next week. Actually, a good point. I'm also going to give, uh, this sounds like one of those programs where you come, everybody's going to get a copy um, of the Pinbuck Path, OK? So we'll give it to you. The only thing I'll ask is this is my intellectual property that you don't share this with the internet. Apparently, it's the thing out there. But just keep this, and you can use it. But just it's, it's, it's a thing that I've been developing. So, um, but I hope you enjoyed it, but I, I think um, if we're going to put it available as a PDF, you'll be able to download it and print it out, and, and hopefully it'll help you. But to be honest, you guys could do this, couldn't you? Chica, I know. There's always one at the table. It's like, I got this. Why? Don't even send it to me. I don't want it. But, for the, but some of you might think I'd like a couple of them, right? Okay. So everybody will be getting a copy. So the answer is yes. You'll get the answers. But what I'm hoping is... You'll, you'll kind of know it, you'll kind of think, but I will send you the answers to see how you got on, OK? Uh, oh, and just so you know, the goal in this exam is to get 70%. That's what I'm looking for. So I want to finish off with this. I used the Odyssey, but I could have used the Sistine Chapel. How many of you have been to the Sistine Chapel? I mean, it is gorgeous, isn't it? So I thought I would use the Sistine Chapel to teach you something. First thing is, it's the most boring box in the world. Think if Apple was wrapping this. You know what's inside this building. This is amazing that what's inside this building is one of the most amazing treasures in humanity. So we're talking about a long time ago, uh, 14, um, the construction of the building under Pope Sixtus the, 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 the fifth, um, Michelang the fourth, sorry. Michelangelo is born around the same time in Florence. And what's interesting is he goes and works as an intern um, for uh, Botticelli. Um, and so he had a connection to them in the beginning. Now, Leonardo, who was older than Michelangelo, um, was in competition with them in Florence. And Michelangelo ran away to Rome, actually, to get away from it, and was attracted to do this thing. Now, he's a, a sculptor. Remember, he's a sculptor. And he was asked to paint the ceiling, probably out of his comfort zone. Exactly this idea. We're going to try and get him to fail, because he was quite a cocky character. But as you know, he did the ceiling. And it was completed four and a half years later. And Pope Julius was the pope then. And Pope Julius is the nephew of Pope Sixtus. It gives us the word nepotism. You've heard of nepotism. That's actually where it comes from. They say he was his nephew, which I think we mean was his son, OK? But they say he was his nephew. Um, and then Raphael, the guy who did these amazing tapestries, comes back and does the work on the tapestries. And Michelangelo finishes um, the wall at the back at the end. So I don't know if the picture is very good, but you understand what's inside this box. It's the most amazing piece of artwork that any one person could do. And it's only 600 meters square. You know, you get the idea. It's, it's, um, it took four and a half years. And it was Goethe who said that, what an amazing amount of work. Next time you say, I've got a lot of work, think, whoa, that's 60 feet up in the air. That's going to hurt your back to do this. But to imagine it and to make it happen, I thought was mind blowing. And if you know, there's three themes, there's three panels. So you have what happened before Adam, what happened about Adam, and what happened after Adam. So he didn't follow the brief at all. The brief was to put stuff about Jesus up there. Not once is Jesus here. Nothing. It's all pre-Testament, all pre, it's all Old Testament work. So the central panel, those of you who've seen it, is this one, isn't it? It's one of the most remarkable painting scenes in the world. And it shows God touching Adam or Adam touching God or God just saying, Adam, wake up, you lazy guy. You know, do something. You can't just lay around there all the time. He's going to reach out. And so he's wrapped up. And in the arms of God, you can see Eve is waiting there to come. And these are all the people. But Eve is the one under his arm. And he's poking through this red thing. What do you think the red thing is? What do you think that red thing is? It looks like a cloak or something like that. It's actually a human brain. So it was only in the 1980s they discovered that this was actually a human brain. And this is amazing that Michelangelo was dissecting human bodies um, and actually against the law. That would have been a, a capital punishment if he had done this. So what I want to leave you with is this idea of the fingers almost touching. We're almost there. And in London, we have this amazing expression on the underground, it's called there, which is mind the gap. Um, so you've seen this. It's called mind the gap. And so. I want you to leave with this idea. I can't do the British accent, but it's mind the gap. Um, mind the gap between the project manager and the sponsor. I think that can happen. Sometimes you end up taking on the role of it's your project. You think, well, who, who's the sponsor? Who's the WSP sponsor for this? In my, in my career, that's happened many times, where the sponsor has drifted away. And then only come back You know, when you want to make sure they don't get too far away. Keep them on a short tether. 
um, mind the gap between the product, which is what we focus on, and the process, which is perhaps what we've been talking about this week, and sometimes they diverge. Is it possible you could have a good product, but not such a good process? And so we want to just, I mean, obviously you have to give a good product, but I want to try and do this as well. But also mind the gap between the academic and the practical. And I think that's what Rich has been saying to us all the time. How do we make sure this doesn't become just an academic exercise? How do we make this touch the ground next week and the weeks after? And that's the hardest thing of all. Believe me, that is the hardest thing of all. Um, I want to leave you with a, a thought here. So um, we have this idea of a maze or a labyrinth. I don't know if you know the difference between a maze. I have a quick question. What is the difference between a maze and a labyrinth? Just get together and say, what's the difference? A labyrinth and a maze. The two are OK, so let's try this. A maze is what's called multicoursal, meaning there are many paths through it. And a labyrinth is monocoursal. There's only one path. And if you find it, you will find your way out, even though it goes all over the place. A labyrinthine way means you can go to the forest. You know, you find this path through the forest. So my point is, let your project be more like a labyrinth, in which case it is going there. We know the project will twist and turn, but not like a maze. And so the point is, don't get lost in your project. You know, don't get lost in your project. But you ever got lost when you're out on a walk in a forest and you think, this is good. You can get lost in the project in the sense that I know where we're going. It's a labyrinthine way. It's not so difficult now. I understand the 47 steps. Now, there was a question. I think you don't have to use all 47, but you understand. We've shown you a way here, and you can start to think about it as you go forward. I have one other thing before we want to go. There were some presentations. Do you remember those? Uh, thank you so much for those who went off first. That was intimidating to go first. Um, and for those who went last, it's also intimidating. Wait until the very end. But we do have a winner. And the winner was chosen by um, Excel. I hope you get to know this. So <laughs> Excel made the decision. There was so much data that there was no way anybody would have known what the winners is. But only three teams got above 20 on average from a table. And so in third place, uh, team 13, you got 20.1. <laughs> And very close to them in second place was Team 2. So well done, Team 2. And I have to say, by, by, by a lot, quite a good margin here, but the numbers don't lie, apparently. So uh, Team 10. And I'd like um, Michelle or one of you to come up here. Could one of you just come up? Here, guys, I'm just going to give you. I give you just thank you so much. Okay, thanks very much. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay, thank you. and I, if I'm missing, is it okay? I did sign it. I did. Okay, I did. That was a shameless plug, um, but <laughs> but I cannot tell you. We you know we discussed this. Would we do this exercise? I thought if we could get everybody up on stage, you know, it would be a cool thing to do. And so. It's, it's difficult logistically, but I think it worked OK. Um, I know it was a burden. You had many things to do this week. You've done a lot of things. But, but thanks for your efforts on that. Um, I'm finished now, and I think what's going to, um, Greg's going to come and speak to you. But I'll be around. And please, I'll be in the New York office. Uh, you can email me. Actually, my email is right there. If anybody wants to write it down, um, you can get me, OK? So thanks very much, guys. It was good to meet you. <laughs>